Welcome to SCSA Church Online. My name is Monica and we're happy you joined us today. Here at SCSA, one of our core values is genuine love for the community. The church is called to be the hands and feet of God, so we have a wide variety of programs that serve our local community with no strings attached. If you have a burning desire to serve, a dream that you can't stop thinking about, a skill you would love to take to the next level, we invite you to visit hopemultiplied.org to find out how you can get involved in serving our local community. And now let's get started with today's message. What do I want? Is this worth it? Do they know who I am? Will this bring me success? What's it in it for me? What do I need to give up for this? What's the fastest way to get what I want? Where am I going? Am I being honest with myself, really? What story do I want to tell? Is there tension here? Where should I focus my attention? What is the right thing to do? What is the wise thing to do? Who do I want to be? Good morning and welcome to STSA Church Online, where I'm sitting here in a makeshift studio once again. You're probably sitting at home on your couch in your living room and your family room. But I trust fully and I hope you do as well, that regardless of where we're sitting this morning, that God is in our midst and that God will be speaking to us. I believe that with all my heart and especially because of the series and the messages that we are going to start sharing today. We're kicking off a brand new series called You Are What You Ask. And I got to be honest, this is one of those series that I've been waiting for, just waiting for the calendar to turn to 2021 so we can kick this thing off because the whole premise of the series is about making better decisions. And who doesn't want to make better decisions in this new year? Well, as we're going to see, the key to making better decisions is actually asking better questions. That's right. Anytime, think of any time you have made a decision that you regret. Maybe it was buying something that you couldn't afford, or maybe it was sticking out in a relationship too long, or maybe it was leaving too soon. Think of any time that you go back and say, I wish I hadn't done that. I regret that decision. I bet you, if you keep on going and keep on asking yourself, you'll get to the point where you might find yourself saying, I wish I had asked more questions, right? Like when we bought the house that we shouldn't have bought, I wish I had asked more questions. We took the job that we shouldn't have taken. I wish I had asked more questions. When we got too far in that relationship, I wish I had asked these questions a little bit earlier on. Because we all know intuitively that asking questions leads to answers and information. And the more information that we have, the better decisions we make. And the better decisions we make, the fewer regrets we will have. And here's the thing, is subconsciously, you already have a framework of questions that you ask yourself before you make a decision. We all do. We all ask ourselves a series of questions. The question is, are you asking yourself the right one? What we usually ask is, will this make me happy? Or maybe, will this make me rich? Or maybe richer? Will this be good for me? Maybe you ask yourself sometimes, will anybody find out if? We all ask ourselves questions. The goal is to ask ourselves the right questions to replace the ones that we usually hear and think about with an arsenal of four questions. That's my goal is to give you in this series, to give you four questions that with any decision you make, you can pause, you can stop, and you can ask yourself these four questions. And at the beginning, it'll take a little bit of time to get used to and be a little bit clunky. But eventually, if we keep on practicing it, like everything in life, we can make it second nature. We can integrate it into our subconscious that before we make any decision, we ask ourselves these four questions. And I promise you, okay, I promise you, promise you, promise you that even if you do nothing with the answers to these questions, even if you don't change your behavior, asking yourself these questions will help you end 2021 making better decisions and with fewer regrets. Why? Because good questions lead to good lead to better decisions and better decisions leads to fewer regrets. That's the goal of this series is to figure out what these good questions are that will lead to the better decisions, knowing that when we make better decisions, that will lead to fewer regrets when all is said and done. Now, let's talk about decisions. Decisions are the joystick of life. They're the steering wheel. Because every day of your life, you are writing the story of your life. You're writing your autobiography, what is going to be said about you one day. You're writing the story by every decision that you make. Think about it. 
Your health, the story of your health is being written one decision at a time by the foods you choose to eat and not eat, by the amount you choose to exercise and not exercise. You're writing the story of your health when all is said and done. You're writing the story of your career when you go into work or now we're at home, when you go to the basement to work, okay? And you write the story of your career with how you choose to work hard or slack off. Push yourself or cut corners. You write the story. You write the story of your marriage. Every decision that you make, every decision to work on your marriage, invest in your husband, okay? Invest in your in your wife, getting more connected with each other versus checking out, going with the lazy approach. You're writing the story of your marriage every single day. The decisions that we make today, you're smart enough, you know this, okay? Intuitively, you know this. The decisions that we make today shape our future tomorrow. The decisions we make today shape our future tomorrow. And some of us, all we need to do is look in the mirror at our physical shape, okay? And we can see the impact of the decisions from yesterday and the day before right on us. Now, as much as we realize, okay, that decisions impact our future, okay, here's kind of the twist of the story. The impact of our decisions actually goes beyond our own future. The impact of our decisions may go beyond our life altogether because it will impact the people around us. It'll impact our children, impact our spouse, impact our friends, impact our parents potentially. And some of you, like let's be honest, some of you sitting here today listening to these words, your life today is influenced by decisions that were made by people way before you, even sometimes before you were even born. Maybe it was by a mother or father or grandparent even. And they may not have been thinking of you at the time. They may not have even had you in their mind. But the decisions they made then surely impact you today. Maybe for some of you, ask yourself how your life would be different today if your dad had learned how to deal with his anger. Maybe your life would be completely different today. If your dad had learned how to deal with his shortcomings or his failures. Some of you out there today, how would your life look different if your mother never decided to run off and to leave the family? Your your life today surely would look significantly different. And in fact, maybe it goes back even further than that. Maybe it goes back to a decision from their mom or their dad that influenced them, that led them to make decisions that influence you. Said another way. There's no such thing as private decisions. There's no such thing as it's none of anyone's business what I do. Because the truth of the matter is this, is that private decisions, private decisions have public implications. Private decisions have public implications. There's no such thing as I do what I want to do and it's no one else's business. It doesn't affect anyone else. No, 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 no. The scary thing today, and I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm just trying to be honest. The scary thing today is that you have no idea, you have no idea what or who hangs in the balance of the decisions you make today. Now, as soon as I say that, you think to yourself, we're doomed. We're doomed. Okay, so it's, it's hopeless. There's no hope because what you're saying is, is that all these people affected me and I'm making decisions that are going to mess up the future and no, no, no. Actually, you know what? My goal is exactly the exact opposite of that. It's not to make you feel hopeless and doomed, but exactly the opposite to actually make you feel back in control, that you can take the steering wheel by your decisions. The goal of this series is not to feel like a victim, but the exact opposite, to take control of our lives. And the way we take control of our lives is by taking control of our decisions. And when we do that, when we start making decisions, Proactively, intentionally, what we end up doing is we write our stories. We write the stories that we get to tell our children one day or our grandchildren, or we write the stories that people will tell about us. You know, 2021, which just began, at some point in time, 2021 will be just a story. Just a story. It will just be something. Like right now, we're in front of us this whole year. Okay, and it's like an empty canvas, like an empty piece of paper. And you write, when all is said and done, what people are going to write about you in 2021. Is this going to be the year that the family fell apart? This is going to be the year that you went off the deep end. This is the year that you lost it all. This is the year that you risked more than you were willing to lose. Or is it going to be the opposite? 
this is going to be the year that you fixed what was broken, that you invested where you needed to invest, that you made wise decisions, that you got it back together, that you invested in the people that was most important to you in your life. You owe it to yourself and you owe it to the people around you to pause and ask yourself the right questions so that you can make better decisions which lead to fewer regrets. Proverbs 22 verse 3 says this, says the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. You know what pay the penalty means? That means regrets. That means things that we'll look back on one day and say, why did I do that? If only I could go back and unmake a decision that I made. The way to get there is asking the right questions because good questions lead to better decisions and better decisions leads to fewer regrets. So what we're going to do in this series, each week for the next for today and the next three weeks, we're going to look at one question. So by the end of the series, you're going to be equipped with four questions that will put, that will engrave in your mind. And you can ask yourself these four questions. And like I said, in the beginning, it'll take some time. It'll be a little clunky, but eventually they'll become part of your decision-making grid where you'll be able to process everything through these. The questions aren't going to be easy, okay? But nothing good ever comes easy. So with that, let's jump into our first question. And the first question is the integrity question. And that is this, am I being honest with myself? Really? Okay, there has to be a pause there, okay? So this question is actually two questions in one, and you could ask it this way. Am I being honest with myself? Am I being honest with myself really? And this question is so important that you have to ask it twice. Am I being honest with myself really? And the reason why this question is so important, and it's the basis of all the other questions, is because let's be honest. When it comes to selling ourselves on bad ideas, we are all expert salesmen. Okay, you may be a salesman at work and you have very little success. You may have never had any training in sales, but I guarantee you there's one person out there. There's one sucker out there that you can sell on just about anything. And that sucker is the one who looks at you in the mirror every morning. Think back to any decision that you regret, that you wish that you didn't make. And I guarantee you, if you think back to it, you were your own worst enemy. You sold yourself on something that you knew you shouldn't do. For example, think back to the last time that you ate something that you wish you hadn't eaten. Okay, think to the last time that you ate a dessert when you were trying to stop the desserts. For me, it's easy to remember because that's called every night in my house because I have a sweet tooth and every day I wake up and I say to myself, no dessert today after dinner. And I got goals all over the wall, okay? And I've made commitments and I got accountability and I got systems. And I, on paper, I'm the healthiest eater on the planet because I know what's good, what's bad. I got a plan. Everything is perfect. But all that goes out the window. It's not just me. All that goes out the window when the salesman starts talking because the salesman, he's good. And the salesman will start to say stuff that later on you look at and you're like, what? I fell for that. But in the moment, for example, Okay, tell me if you've heard any of these, okay? And you can look around with the people who you're sitting with, okay? And you can confess to each other. How many times the salesman has told you this? I didn't eat dessert all day, so therefore a little bit won't hurt me right now. I didn't eat dessert all day, so therefore a little bit won't hurt me right now. Well, that didn't make any sense. If, if it was going to hurt you in the morning, it'll hurt you just as much in the evening. That's like saying, I didn't shoot myself all day, so I can shoot myself right now. Well, that doesn't make any sense, but in the moment when the salesman is going, how about this one? I had a long day. I'm tired. I deserve a brownie. <laughs> okay. I had a long day. I deserve a brownie. But the brownie is going to make you more tired. Like, you know that. The sugar and the sweets don't add to your energy. It actually makes you much worse. <laughs> how about this one? Okay. And again, this one is a for sure for one with me. It's okay if I eat dessert. I'm going to exercise later. <laughs> it's okay if I eat dessert. I'm going to exercise later. Well, no, that's actually the reason not to eat the dessert right now. Because what's the point of exercising? Like, you're just going to undo what you did. Like, if the goal of exercising is to get ahead, you just took a step back. Bottom line is, you and me, let's be honest. We're suckers for ourselves. We are suckers for ourselves. We can sell ourselves anything. And if you're honest, anytime you look back, on a decision that you regret, 
There's no one to blame except you. You were your own worst enemy. Look what Solomon the wise says in Proverbs 18, verse 17. He says, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. The one who states his first case first seems right until someone comes in and says, hey, wait a minute. How do you know that's true? Are you sure about that? And can we double check that? Can we fact check? Okay, that's a big thing these days. Can we fact check? How do we know that's true? Well, what I'm saying is the same way we want to fact check everyone else. And everyone who says anything these days, we want to know if it's true. We need to learn how to do that to ourselves. We lie to ourselves all the time and we need to learn. We owe it to ourselves and the people whose lives will be affected by our decisions. We owe it to them to pause and ask ourselves this question. Am I being honest with myself? Really? Let me give you some more examples of how we, we, we lie to ourselves. How many times you ask yourself this question? How many times? Are you late to a meeting or an event or some kind of an engagement? How many times are you late and you lie about the reason that you were late? Be honest. How many times you're late and you say, oh, there was traffic. Or, oh, you know, my kids uh, needed me uh, right before I had, kids had a project right before I had to leave the house. Or there was an emergency that took place right before I had to leave the house. We say those things and we convince ourselves that they're true. But are they really true? Is it really true that there was traffic? Or is it true that there was a little bit of traffic you, but, but the real problem was you left 10 minutes later than you should have left. Okay, you budgeted 10 minutes for a 20 minute drive. And yeah, there was one light that turned red. So you say, oh, it was the lights and there's the traffic. Really? You say your kids had a project, okay, before you had to leave the house. Well, what was the project? Was the project help mommy find her phone because she lost it? That's the kid's project? How about the emergency? There was an emergency. You and I both know the truth was there was no emergency. The emergency was when you looked in the mirror and you saw what you looked like, okay, before you wanted to leave the house, you want to look like that. That's the emergency. We lie to ourselves all the time. We lie to ourselves, okay, a little bit more serious. We lie to ourselves all the time about why we're angry. Why are you really angry? No, why are you really, why are you angry really? Why is it you got upset from this comment? No, why you got upset really? Why is it you didn't go to this event? Why you, why you didn't go, really? Why is it you won't call your mom or dad? Why is it you took this job? Why is it that you left this way? Why is it that you refused to? Why is it that you can't stop? These questions matter. Asking ourselves the question, am I being honest with myself, really, it matters. Because you can't make the best decision for yourself until you are honest with yourself. Hey, you can't make the best decision for yourself. I know you want to make the best decision for yourself. We all are trying to do, we all have the best intentions and the best mindset. We all want to do what's best for ourselves. But you cannot do what's best for yourself until, until you are honest with yourself. I used to be a computer programmer back in the day. You give me bad data, I give you bad results. Okay, if the information that we are collecting before making the decision is not accurate, then there's no way we're going to make good decisions. And you owe it to yourself. And you owe it to the people Whose, whose lives are impacted by your decision. You owe it to them to get the best data, to get the honest data, and then to make the best decision. And the way you do that is by asking yourself, am I being honest with myself? Am I being honest with myself, really? Now, I wanna show you a verse that, that, in, that encapsulates this idea of being dishonest with ourselves. And it's a verse that you've probably seen before, maybe heard before, but I want to show you the context of this verse. So I'm going to show you the verse, and then I want you to understand the context, because when you understand the context in which it was written, it makes it much more powerful. The verse comes from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 9. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Notice he doesn't say my heart is desperate, is, is deceitful, or your heart. He's saying the heart, meaning it's, it's a condition of humanity, okay? And it's a scary thought when he says this, but all humanity, my heart is deceitful, your heart is deceitful, your parents' heart was deceitful, Mother Teresa's heart is deceitful, uh, uh, the, the Pope's heart is deceitful, even Michael Jordan the Great, okay, even his heart is deceitful. Like, there is no one who is beyond this idea of the heart is deceitful. It's a condition of humanity. And notice, too, he also says the word deceitful, not dishonest. There's a difference between the two. Deceitful and dishonest are not the same. Dishonest means tells lies. 
Okay. And to be very frank, telling a lie is not a big deal. We all know people who are dishonest. It's not a big deal. Not, not saying it's not a big deal to be dishonest, but I'm saying it's not dangerous. The danger comes in the deceitful person because deceit implies an agenda. Someone trying to trick me, someone trying to convince me of something for their sake or their benefit. The heart is not dishonest. The heart is deceitful. And because of that, it's dangerous. Deceitful means, like dishonest means tells you lies. Deceitful means tells you truth, truth, lie. Truth, truth, half truth. And it mixes it all together in some kind of concoction, which makes you believe, 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 and not pay attention. And that's why he says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? How many times have you said to yourself, if we're honest, this is all of us. How many times you said to yourself, you look back on a decision and you say to yourself, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? Why did I do that? Why did I choose that? Why did I go there? Why did I stop that? The answer to those questions, why is it that we do the things that we tell others not to do that we know is not good for us? The answer is right there because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In other words, you sold yourself. You sold yourself on something that was not good for you. You've heard of this idea. It's a, it's, a, it's a popular concept these days of confirmation bias. Confirmation bias means that we don't listen to the truth and then make up our minds. That's not what we do. Confirmation bias says that what we do is we make up our minds and then we find evidence to support our position. Okay, this is the world of social media. This is why you have your political opinion or your opinion about whatever it may be, and you don't read articles that tell you the opposite. But And if you find one of those, you quickly dismiss it. But if you find one that tells you what you believe, you repost and you reshare. Confirmation bias says that we don't care about being truthful as much as we care about being right. We decide what we want, and then we find evidence to support it. Sir Francis Bacon, who lived in the 16th century, once said it this way. He said, the human understanding, when it has once adopted an opinion, draws all, all things else to support and agree with it. Okay, again, this is the important part. When once it has adopted an opinion, once it's made up its mind, once it's sold itself, once it's decided this is the right thing to do, this is the right relationship to be in, this is the right house to buy, this is the right job to take, this is the right direction to go. Once it has adopted an opinion, it draws all things to support and agree with it. It goes on. And though there be greater number and weight of instances to be found on the other side, yet these it either neglects or despises or else by some distinction sets aside and rejects. Tell me you don't see that today. Tell me you don't see that all over around you. It's easy to see this in everyone else. But we got to realize it also exists in ourselves and the man in the mirror just as much as in everyone else. Now, you're saying to yourself, I see it with, you know, my mom definitely needs to hear this. Oh, no, my wife. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, my children. Oh, my dad. Oh, my husband. Oh, my boss. Oh, yeah, they really need to hear this, Father Anthony. But not me. I'd never be that dumb. I'd never sell myself on something like that. I'm unbiased. I'm fair. I'm objective. Well, let me show you the context in which this verse was written. This verse was said by the prophet Jeremiah, who lived in the 7th century BC, and he was like an advisor to many of the kings of Israel, okay, of God's people, of, of Judah, the southern kingdom. And many of the kings, unfortunately, didn't listen to his advice. And looking back on it, I guarantee you, every single one of them, if they could go back, would listen to his advice because they'd have saved themselves a lot of regret and a lot of heartache. He would repeatedly warn the kings of the dangers of disobeying God and ignoring his commandments. But unfortunately, like I said, is most of them ignored him and his exhortation. And instead, what they would do is they would talk themselves in to the most foolish decisions that right now any person can objectively look back and say, what were you thinking, man? What were you thinking? And we'll see an example of that right now, two examples of it. But at the time, here's the key. At the time, they convinced themselves that what they were doing was the wise thing. Now, just as a side note, before we get into Jeremiah and what he said, as a side note, you never, this is an important point to keep in mind, you never, ever, ever need to talk yourself into a good decision. When it's a good decision, you rarely have to sell yourself 
And that's one of the things that I've actually, to be honest with me, I find myself, when I find myself trying to convince myself, trying to sell myself an idea, oh yeah, and, and it could be, and when I find myself trying to convince myself, I hit pause. I take a step back and say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why am I trying to sell? If this was truly such a good idea, good ideas sell themselves. When the decision is the right, the wise decision, the healthy decision, the good long-term decision, it doesn't require a lot of justifying. And I heard it said one time that justifying is actually just a lying to ourselves. When we find ourselves justifying, we're just a lying to ourselves and trying to convince ourselves of what it is that we want to do. Back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah lived, like I said, at a time where he was an advisor to many kings. One of the kings that he advised was a king named Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim came at a time where Israel was living under the Babylonian Empire. Okay, they were their own nation, but they were under the Babylonian Empire, which basically means that they were like a puppet state. Okay, They're allowed to do what they want, and they have their own quote-unquote freedom, but they had to pay a tribute to the Babylonian Empire, which is led by Nebuchadnezzar. And if they did that, they had the protection from Babylon Okay, and the empire. They were part okay, of, of, the, of, of the Babylonian Empire, and it was kind of like a mafia. Okay, so you are free to do what you want as long as you keep on paying this, but you are subject to us. Okay, if we ever tell you to do something or come to war with us, whatever it may be. Well, at one point in time, Jehoiakim gets this crazy idea in his mind that enough is enough. He is going to rebel against Babylon and he is going to liberate the kingdom of, of Israel, the children of God from these people. So he decides to stop paying the tribute and in essence declares war on Nebuchadnezzar. Now. At the time, Israel, like I said, is not a mighty nation. They're a puppet state at best. In fact, they're divided in two. So we're really talking about just the southern kingdom, which is really Jerusalem is the main city. Now, I want to show you a map. Okay, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why this is a bad decision by Jehoiakim. Look at this map right here. Okay, you see the Babylonian Empire, okay, with all those cities. Do you see where Jerusalem is? Okay, right here, I highlighted Jerusalem for you. Look at Jerusalem. I'm not a war hero kind of a guy. I'm not a great military strategist, but I don't think that little dot right there has much of a chance against the rest of the empire. I don't think this is a very wise decision. I mean, this is like, I don't know, this is like a small town in rural Kentucky deciding to declare war on the United States of America. Like, you're, uh, you don't need to be a prophet to realize this is a bad decision, Jehoiakim. Don't do this. Jeremiah goes to the king. And he begs him, he pleads with him, don't do this. This is going to cause a lot more harm than, than, than you realize. King had already made up his mind. He'd already sold himself. The salesman had already told him, no, you can do this. And this is a great idea. And you're going to be a great hero. He goes through with it. He does it. And as expected, just like Jeremiah said, Nebuchadnezzar, not happy, comes in, invades, okay, destroys a bunch of stuff, messes up a bunch of stuff, kills a bunch of people. And he captures King Jehoiakim and he adds them to his collection. That's right, I said his collection. Nebuchadnezzar, in case you didn't know this, was an evil and wicked ruler. And he was so wicked that what he used to do, he would go into a city or a country or whatever it was, he would invade, he would kill whoever he wanted to kill, but he would never kill the king. He would always capture him alive, and he would bring him back as a prisoner and put him in his collection. That's right. Some people collect coins, some people collect stamps, some people collect birds, some people collect maybe crosses or whatever it may be. Nebuchadnezzar used to collect kings. He'd put them in his prison, and anytime he wanted to show his might and his power, he would bring them all out, arrayed in these gold chains, and they would parade around, and he would show how mighty he is. And when they paraded around, they would all hold each other on the shoulders like this. The reason why? Because in addition to capturing them and dressing them up, he also had each one of them blinded. And that was his way of showing his power. Well, that's what happened to Jehoiakim as well. After he gets rid of Jehoiakim, what the Nebuchadnezzar does is he puts another king in his place. Okay, and every time a king rebelled, he shut him down, add him to the collection, and then he would insert his own king. Eventually comes King Zedekiah. And Zedekiah, believe it or not, does the exact same thing that he saw Jehoiakim do and fail miserably. He decides, I'm going to free the people. I'm going to be a war hero. We're going to liberate the people of Israel. And everyone's going to say, Je Je Zedekiah the Great, Zedekiah the Great. Jeremiah comes to him, pleads with him. Don't repeat the same mistake. 
It's going to lead to the death of thousands of people. But you know what he did? Okay, what Zedekiah did? He didn't shut up the salesman that was inside him that was convincing him. He shut Jeremiah up. He had Jeremiah thrown in a well and told basically, leave me alone. I want to listen to you. Oh, Zedekiah, if only you had done that with that salesman, you could have saved yourself a lot of heartache and a lot of problems. But kings will be kings, right? Second Chronicles 36, 12 says, He, Zedekiah, did evil in the sight of the Lord his God and did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke from the mouth of the Lord. What Zedekiah didn't realize is the exact same thing that happened to Jehoiakim, but actually worse. Nebuchadnezzar came. He basically surrounded the city so that no food could come into it. And eventually, he just waited, waited, waited till the people were going to starve. And this is when the people saw some very dark days and people started even cannibalism and eat their children to stay alive. And what ended up happening, he just waited for them to be weakened. Then he came in, destroyed the city, captured Zedekiah. And what he had Zedekiah do is he had him witness the death of his own children. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar took the children of Zedekiah and he had Zedekiah stand there as he slaughtered his children right in front of his eyes. And speaking of his eyes, that was the last thing that Zedekiah would see because shortly after that, he had his eyes put out and added to the collection. And what Zedekiah didn't see coming was not only all this destruction and hardship and heartache, but Zedekiah ended up being the last king of the nation of Judah, of God's people. Back to Jeremiah 17, 9, because this... This story that I just told you, that's the context in which Jeremiah says this verse again. The heart is deceitful above all things. Jedekiah Jehoiakim, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Zedekiah, Jehoiakim convinced themselves what they were doing was right. They were never honest with themselves about their true motivations. They convinced themselves, this is the will of God. This is what God wants. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, that'll never be me. I'll never be that blind. I'll never be that deceived. I'll never be sold on something so 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 wrong. Are you sure about that? Let's start easy and let's get a little more difficult. How many times have you purchased something that you didn't need? Be honest. How many times, like I'm, I'm not judging you. I'm telling you, this is one of my weaknesses, okay? When, when, you're, when you're buying something on Amazon, okay? And then you see the, you might like, you've seen that before, or customers who purchased this item also purchased, okay? How many times have you not needed anything else? You see that little customers who also purchased, and all of a sudden, you need, you need. How have you lived your whole life without whatever doodad or gadget or gadget or whatever it is that, 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 that Amazon is telling me? Like Amazon is telling me I need it. Who am I to argue? Will of God, right? Maybe it's more than just a little gadget. Maybe for you, it wasn't a small gadget that you purchased on Amazon. Maybe it was a house that you purchased to put you in debt and set you back and you haven't recovered since. Maybe it was a financial investment that you talked yourself into. Maybe it was a business deal where you ignored the advice of others, but you convinced yourself, this is the way to get rich. Let's go a little more. Maybe it wasn't a purchasing decision. Maybe it was a relationship decision. Maybe it was one of those where after two dates, you knew, your mama knew, your friends knew, even the barista at Starbucks knew, like everyone knew, this guy, no good. This girl, not for you, okay? He's no good, she's no good, but you, you kept on going. You kept on going. You, ke you kept on trying, to, you kept on going. And looking back on it now, you're like, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? How could I be so deceived? Well, I'll tell you how you could be deceived. Because the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked, who can know it? It was your heart. It was the, the condition of humanity, which is to sell themselves and convince ourselves of things that aren't true. You convinced yourself. You convinced yourself. He's got no job. He's got no money. He's got no plans of a career. But you know what? That's just because he hasn't found himself yet. And I'm sure once he finds himself, think about how silly that sounds. Think if I come to you and I say, hey, I got a great guy for you. I got a great guy for you. I don't want to set you up with this guy. He's got no job. He got no money. And he has no prospect of a career. But trust me, once the boy finds himself, Woof, he's going to be a real winner. Trust me. Like it sounds silly when we say it out loud, but somehow in our head. How's that? The heart is deceitful above all else. 
Maybe it was a little more serious. Maybe it was one of those, I don't know how to put this in a category, but I'm going to call it unexpected decisions. Those unexpected decisions, those things that came upon us that we never saw coming, came suddenly, we got carried away in the emotion, and all of a sudden, maybe you're married. And yeah, your spouse isn't perfect. He's working on some stuff. She's working on some stuff. They're not perfect. But then all of a sudden, in the midst of maybe a fight or something made you feel bad, you read this article online and you start to think, and then all of a sudden this guy on the internet or this guy at work or this girl in your office or whatever it is, and all of a sudden they're kind and they're listening and they're caring. And all of a sudden you focus on the 20% that you're missing, okay? I've said this before, is that every marriage you get 80%, but no one is 100%. No spouse is 100%, okay? So every in your marriage, your spouse is giving you 80%. And there's 20% that they're lacking. And so often we foolishly, we foolishly trade in that 80% to get 20% from someone else. We find, oh, he's got the 20%. She's got the 20%. Oh, that's exactly what my life was missing. But what you don't realize is you're getting the 20, but you're losing the 80, which is a bad deal where I'm coming. If I give you, if I give you $2, I'm sorry, if I give you $8 and you only give me two back, that's a bad deal. And that's what happens. All of a sudden, something in your marriage, it's not perfect. You got your 80. Yeah, you're struggling with that 20. You're trying to make that 20 down to 19, down to make it 18, down to make it 17. The best marriage, maybe get to a 15. Okay, okay, but no one's going to get to a zero with that. But all of a sudden, you find someone with that 20. And you convince yourself. You sell yourself a bad idea. You sell yourself on, I'll never be happy until I have that 20. And you convince yourself, well, God wants me to be happy, right? God wants, God don't want me to be happy. And all of a sudden, you don't think to yourself. You don't think to yourself about that 80% you're losing. You don't think to yourself about what your role in making all this is. You don't think to yourself about the kids. You don't think to yourself about any of those things. You walk away and you lose everything. And I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, you come a point in time, if you don't pause to ask yourself, am I being honest with myself, come a point in time where you will look back, you will ask yourself, what was I thinking? The problem is not just you. It's not just me. It's all of us. That's what Jeremiah was saying. It's Zedekiah. It's Jehoiakim. It's every single one of us. The heart is deceitful above all else. It's what made Zedekiah and Jehoiakim think they could lead a tiny city against a big nation. And they really thought they'd get away with this, even though they had seen it fail time and time again. I can tell you stories, story after story after story. And I promise you every week I hear a new story of people, smart people, successful people, like spiritual people. I just heard a story recently about someone who actually was very influential in my walk with God, someone who helped me to get to where I am today. And I just heard a story about this person, about how they made a very, very bad decision financially, a business decision, which is going to destroy them and their family and probably their children's family for many generations to come. They made a bad decision and they decided to cut a corner that they shouldn't have cut. And I'm telling you, smart, successful, spiritual, dishonest with themselves, lied to themselves, deceived by the heart. And that's why we need to pause. That's why we need to pause before we make a mistake. Now I realize <laughs> it's kind of a depressing message. But again, I promise you, that's not my goal. My goal is not to depress you. My goal is actually to give you hope. Because while there is no solution, there's no cure for the heart that's deceitful, there is hope. And the hope is, okay, think of it this way. Let's say you knew like your physical heart, you had a condition with your physical heart where it was like bleeding or blood pressure or, you know, thick blood or thin blood or whatever it may be. You had a permanent condition with your heart. If you had that, you would take a constant, regular, consistent action. Okay. You got thick blood, you take blood thinner. You got blood pressure, you take, you know, anti-blood pressure, whatever it may be, or cholesterol, whatever it is. If you knew that you had a permanent condition with your heart, you would see constant attention and give constant care to addressing it every single day. Same is true with the heart in a spiritual sense. Proverbs chapter four, verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Do you know what the issues of life are? <laughs> the issues of life are those things, those regrets, those bad decisions, those problems, those consequences that, that from the verse we saw earlier, the pay the penalty. Where's all that come from? It comes from the heart. 
and the deceitful heart that sells us on bad decisions. So what we're going to do, okay, and I'm going to challenge you to do is we need to check our heart regularly. We need, like I said, with something that's constantly in there, that's asking ourselves, are you being honest? Are you telling the truth? Are you, and again, ask it a second time with the word really, because somehow the second time, and sometimes, you know what? Sometimes it helps even to say it in the mirror. Am I being honest with myself? Am I being honest with myself really? Am I telling myself the truth? Is that really why I did that? Is that really why I insist on that? Is that really why I refuse that? Is that really why? If you knew that I was a deceitful person, if I'm a deceitful person, and I came in and gave you advice, you wouldn't listen to what I say. You would challenge me. you say, how do you know? And prove that and tell me again. And you would check the facts because you knew I'm deceitful. Well, I'm telling you, your heart is deceitful. Your heart is deceitful. So you can't just take the first thing that it tells you with whatever emotional response or whatever off the top of your head. We need to challenge our hearts and ask ourselves, am I being honest with myself? Am I being honest with myself really? Here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. With every question, I'm going to give you a question and a challenge. And this is what we're going to do. The integrity decision. I will not lie to myself, even when the truth makes me feel bad about myself. I want you to say that with me. I want everyone to say this with me. Say it with me as I'm saying it. I will not lie to myself, even when the truth makes me feel bad about myself. As we wrap up here, I'm going to ask some tough questions. And I realize I'm going to ask these questions, and some of these questions have nothing at all to do with you. Maybe there's one or two. And I want you, as I ask these questions, don't give the answer that you tell everyone else. Don't give the answer that you convinced yourself. Like no one is listening to you. No one, even if you're in a room with other people right now, no one can read your mind. Okay, so everyone's going to look straight ahead. No looking to the left or the right. Everyone looks straight ahead and be honest with yourself. Okay, you owe it to yourself. You don't need to be honest with me. I don't even, like I said, I don't even care if you do anything with the answer to this, but you owe it to yourself to be honest. You owe it to yourself to tell the truth, to not deceive yourself. Let me ask you some questions. What's the real reason you don't call that family member? What's the real reason you don't call that family member? What's the real reason you don't call your mom or your dad or your brother or your sister or your son or your daughter? What's the real reason you didn't want to call and wish them Merry Christmas? What's the real reason? Why did you walk away from that relationship? Why did you walk away from that relationship really? Whether it's a friendship, a romantic relationship, a marriage, why did you walk away from it? Or why did you stay in it? What's the real reason that you stayed in that dating relationship so long? What's the real reason that you're still in it? Really, what's the reason? What's the reason you got so upset at that comment? What's the reason that that offended you so deeply? What's the real reason? What's the real reason that you walked away from church? Why'd you walk away from church? No, really. Why'd you walk away from church? Last question. Why is it these questions are making you so uncomfortable right now? No, really. Why is it these questions are making you so uncomfortable? What truth is it that you are trying your best is it that you're trying your best to not see and to turn your head from? 2021 is going to be a year. Okay, already it's a year like no other. And this is going to be a year that I'm challenging you and myself and all of us to be brutally honest, brutally honest with ourselves and challenge ourselves to not accept the lies, not accept the lies and the deceit that we tell ourselves. I'm going to challenge you to be brutally honest and ask yourself every time, am I being honest with myself? Am I being honest with myself really? What's the real reason that I'm doing this? You owe it to yourself. You owe it to yourself and you owe it to the others whose lives are affected by the decisions you make. I, like I said in the beginning, you don't know who or what hangs in the balance of your decisions today and you owe it to yourself and to them to at least know the answer to this question. And when you do, what you're going to discover is what Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 32. You shall know the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Yes, the truth may be uncomfortable, but ultimately, like Jesus said, it's truth that liberates us and allows us to live freely. Let's bow our heads for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message 
this slap in the face, this wake-up call that we need. Lord, we're done lying to ourselves. and We're done being deceived. Lord, we want to go to the truth. And I pray that you would help us all to ask ourselves tough questions and to be honest with our answers. We're not fooling anyone except ourselves, Lord, and enough is enough, Lord. We want to know the truth behind what's going on inside of us. Accept our prayers this day in the name of your Son, the prayers of all your saints. Hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us here today. One of the things, I'm going to give you another piece of homework, okay? I'm going to put here up on the screen a few questions, three questions that I would love, love, love for you to dig into now while the, while the message is fresh. And you can dig into these in a personal way, but I would really, really, really love it if you would discuss them with those who you're watching this message with, or maybe you give a call to a friend or another family and you spend some time discussing what you heard today and, and your answers to these questions, okay? If we do that, then we will truly learn how to make better decisions, which will lead to fewer regrets in this coming year. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us here today. You can find us on any social media platform and feel free to share a message that inspires you with family and friends. If there's anything we can do for you, visit our website and let us know how we can help or how we can pray for you. If you aren't receiving our weekly email, please click the Stay Connected button on our website. Have a great day.